Welcome to the Smack Happy Design Video Cast, where we explore all things web and marketing. With your hosts, Nicole and Danielle. Uh, welcome to the Smack Happy Video Cast, episode number five. Uh, today we have Neil with us from Neil David Photography. Um, he is an expert photographer and we're going to talk to him about why he started his business in the first place and what it's like running a small business. Um, so Neil, can you um, give us a quick little intro about who you are? Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks, Danielle, for having me today. Um, so my business is Neil David Photography. I focus on business marketing and portrait and lifestyle family photography. On the commercial side with the business marketing work, I'm typically telling stories or going behind the scenes with businesses. And um, on the lifestyle family side, I'm, I'm getting out there and rambling around in the park or the woods or taking a hike and, and doing storytelling for families. Awesome. Um, I'll go next. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Danielle. If you haven't um, met me before, I guess either via the video cast or episode or podcast, I think we're all calling it an episode now. Uh, I work for Smack Happy. I've been with Nicole and Smack Happy for about a year and I do lots of cool things um, when it comes to marketing. Um, and that's me in a nutshell. And I'm Nicole Hanasek, your other host or hostess. Um, I own Smack Happy. I've had the company for about 10 years now, and I've been designing and coding websites for about 20 years. Um, and we started this here, a little podcast, so we could get to know our, our clients, our referral partners, and fellow small business owners a little better, and hopefully share some insight. Actually, Nicole, I wanted to tell you really quick, uh, yesterday, I don't know if you noticed, but on LinkedIn, it was your official 10-year anniversary with, with Smack Happy. So it's not about 10 years, it's officially 10 years, <laughs> probably officially longer, years. because I can't figure out still how LinkedIn like kind of uh, aggregates that, but I don't know. Yeah. So congratulations. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, so in our last episode, what did we talk about? Okay, so the last episode, episode four, was about consistency in marketing and kind of consistency in general um, with our guest, Rachel Plass, a marketing expert. Um, and one interesting thing I wanted to mention about this, uh, if you're looking to go back and view or listen to this one, um, one of the things about the last discussion that was that was really cool was a lot of the things that we talked about all kind of tied in with branding, which is so funny because you would think it's kind of obvious, like, okay, branding and staying consistent in your marketing, you have to have a great brand at first, but um, sometimes it's not as obvious and sometimes it's not as clear where to start with that sort of thing. We kind of touched on that quite a bit um, and, you know, how starting there can really get you a good foot in the door when it comes to being consistent in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's go ahead and dive into our discussion with Neil. So how did you get started in the photography business? That's a great loaded question, huh? Like, how did we all get started? Um, <laughs> I, I'm glad you sent me um, a, a short outline of what we were going to be chatting about because it was fun to actually think about that. Um, mm -hmm. I've been doing photography for about seven years full time now. Um, and I, I got started in that business, honestly, out of a need or a want to do something on my own. So I kind of followed like, you know, like almost uh, 30 years of following the logical path of college and job and then wanting a better job, going back to grad school. Um, and I had studied environmental studies and sustainability. And I did a little stint of green building consulting um, for a large a multinational architecture firm and it was like this great big grandiose job but it wasn't super fulfilling in the ways that I kind of thought I would be on that path of so uh, after moving around with that company to a couple cities they did get me to San Francisco as a city I always wanted to live in and then I got the gift of being laid off about a year after kind of being rehired and moved here 
Um, and I didn't want a corporate job anymore. I didn't, I was kind of done with having a job. I wasn't, I, I'm honestly not a great employee. Um, and I really just always kind of wanted to, to lead my own way and, and do my own things. And I always kind of, I don't know, rebelled against the machine and all that stuff. But, um, I found a passion. I always had a passion for photography and I really just wanted to, to run with it. So I had dabbled in it a little bit part time. And once I, like I said, got the gift of being laid off, I was kind of like, well, let's throw all of my eggs in this basket for a few months, see what happens. And it picked up steam and the kind of the rest is history, I guess they say. So are you mostly self-taught with all of the, you know, the functions of the camera and composition? Yeah. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I'd say it's a, a healthy mix of, like self-taught dabbling, spending tons of time at a formidable age, like a kid, you know, like my camera, I don't know, I was probably single digits in age. The first time a camera was put in my hand, I just was, I was just in love with it. It's like the classic story of someone gives you a camera and you just love it. Um, my parents always had picked family pictures of us and photo albums. And I was always fascinated with the still image with photography, I always was fascinated. I was not good at painting or drawing or like other kind of artistic pursuits, but I loved photography. Um, I loved composition and light and different, you know, black and white and color. I loved what you could do with a camera. Um, so I was always fascinated with it. So I spent a lot of time with it. I had friends who were into photography and we'd hang out together and learn. And then as I got older, I would take classes and continuing education kind of stuff. I didn't really take much classes in college or high school with it. Um, but, and when I got older, I took a lot of like continuing ed stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So what, what are the top three things you'd need to know before getting started with photography? If you were to inspire a a budding photographer? <laughs> um, that's another great question because to boil it down to three is so tough. As you guys know from running businesses, there's so many things that go into each day. Um, but I think one of the number one things I would think about in that realm is that it's really not all fun in photos. Um, mm -hmm. Like it's, it's great and it's, it's fun and it, the photography is a part of it. But when it comes to like running a full-time business um i'd say 80 percent of it is like marketing networking hustling schmoozing working behind the scenes uh, doing the post-production stuff like that i mean maybe 10 or 20 percent of a typical work week of mine is actually on a shoot at a location behind the camera like maybe 10 or 20 percent um so i think that's the number one thing is like yeah it's all fun and games until it becomes a business and then that business part really kicks in <laughs> yeah isn't there some sort of saying like if you really love to do something like not to do it as a career because you won't love it anymore yeah yeah <laughs> um shame I think I we went through that with it too. Uh, it definitely did. I went through like ups and downs. I was like ready to toss my camera out, you know, out the window and watch it shatter. Like I, I, yeah, you go through a lot with it, um, for sure. And I never considered myself like an artiste, you know. But I always kind of liked the the mathematics of of photography. I think I'm not that I'm a math guy, but there was something like. There's a lot of geometry and physics and there's a lot of stuff with photography that was scientific that I really liked. Um, and then the business stuff just kind of, that's another thing I never, I didn't study that much. I mean, a little bit, um, classes and stuff. I had like part, you know, some courses in like business, but it was the real world where I really got my, got my, um, riches on there for sure. But yeah, we, we actually talked a little bit about that exact same thing with Crystal in another episode. Um, what was it? The harsh reality of running a business. Yeah. And um, one of the things that we talked about was kind of like, uh, okay, the controversial MBA sort of thing. So like a lot of people kind of go to, oh, if I want to run a business, I need to go out and I need to get this. But while that's awesome and while education is, is very good, I, I don't disagree with being educated in a university or something like that, but you get that real experience when you're actually, you know, putting yourself in the business and, and doing the things like the day-to-day -day things and figuring things out and making mistakes and learning from them and doing it that way. Um, when, when it really comes like full circle for like, oh, wow, this is how really this works. <laughs> And, and, you know, maybe some people expect it to be the way it turns out, but I think most, most people are unexpected 
or get that unexpected, you know, surprise of, Oh, okay. This is how it really is. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you don't have to go to school to be an expert or college right, or by right. these, these days, you know, like um, we were talking before we, we got on and, you know, we, we have, some of us have, we have children, right. <laughs> and, uh, and people watching this are going to have children and I'm sure they're like, I have an 18 month old. I'm just getting started on the parenting um, the parenting experience with another one on the way in July. So I'm like, what am I for these two little guys? Do I care if they go to college? Like me, I went to college. I went back to school. I got a master's degree. It's hanging on the wall in the office. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a big fat payment I got to put out there every month. Um, because I made some bad decisions with private loans and stuff like that. And I'm ironically paying for that education with a totally different career. I completely pivoted into something completely different. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not saving for college for, for either of them. We're saving for the, whatever they want to do, you know, and I'm, yeah. it's not going to go into like a traditional college savings that they have to use for that. So I'm going to let them figure it out. Um, because, you know, I think it's good that I went, I'm glad I went to college and grad school even, um, because those life experiences you can't ever mm-hmm. take back. You know, like I was almost 30 and I was like back at school full time with like a 20 hour week job. And it was like being in college again. It was rad. Um, but I'm paying for it now, you know, but it was, yeah. it was awesome. A good experience. And it brought me where we are, right? All our experiences bring us to where we are. Yeah. Yes. I think that kind of brings up a good point too, that you shouldn't be afraid to pivot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you know, if that, if that wasn't right for you, then don't be afraid to, you know, turn around and try something different that will make you happier. Right. Yeah, like what a weird decision, right? To like go and be <laughs> working for like this 2,000 employee, 20 offices all over the world, you know, having like international video chats like this. And it was, you know, consulting on airport design and, and commercial buildings and jails and, you know, all the other things, hospitals and stuff. And now I'm like photographing those places that I used to kind of consult on, which is cool. But yeah, it's totally different, totally different experience for me. You know, and I know people, you know, there's some people are like serial entrepreneurs and they just start businesses and sell them yeah. and, and all that stuff. Um, I think that can get a little out of hand, but in terms of like really committing and putting your passion in and then realizing, Hey man, I want to change gears now. It's not like generations ago where you had like two, three jobs your whole life. You know, it, it's like average person has at least seven, I think, if not, you know, more career changes in their lives now. So, yeah, I can, I can be the first one to say I've had about a million jobs up until now. <laughs> I hope it, I hope it kind of like the trend goes down, you know, now that I'm with Smack Happy, I don't have mm-hmm. to have, you know, 16, 17 more jobs or whatever, but um, yeah. I guess it's just the nature of how everything is now. Um, always trying to find something better or something more or something different. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I think that I can relate to everything, you know, you guys are both saying because it's like, you know, you really just want to do a lot of things that are going to be good for you and for your family and for your future and things like that. And it's hard to do that now staying with one job or, you know, sticking with something that you're not, you know, your heart isn't in. Um, you know, people get really super miserable when that happens after years of being in the same job anyway. So I don't think I'd have it any other way. <laughs> yeah. Like back to kind of what you were saying about getting started in the business. Part of what I wanted was to own everything I did in a way. Like now it's like, I felt like I had no freedom. Like like having a job's fine. Like I'm not knocking that at all. I think if you want to just have a job and do your thing, that is totally cool. Some people love to go to work, put that stuff away, come back home, spend time with their family. Um, And part of what I think is stressful about having your own business is you're kind of always at work and you have to like turn it off or turn it on and every decision you make is on your own. But I actually really, I I thrive on that, you know, a lot. Um, You know, my wife, my wife runs her own business as well. I do kind of like part time with that as well, or almost half time, kind of split my time um, with her business, Songbird Studios, which is teaching, teaching singing. So I'm doing business development there. And that's great too, because I'm like, it's her brainchild, it's her passion. She's the singer, but then I can look at it from the like, well, I want this business to really succeed and I can help it with a different lens. Um, And then we own like literally everything we do with our decision making. So that part was really important to us. It's also like really scary and really challenging. And, you know, sometimes you're at work at seven in the morning, sometimes you're at work at 10 at night, but you know, sometimes you're snowboarding on a Tuesday. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's that different lifestyle. 
mm-hmm. that I craved, <laughs> which is part of why we got into running our own businesses. So with Songbird Studios, you mostly help her with the business end of things, like processes and systems and... Yeah, yeah. My to- my like official title is co-owner and business partner. So my my main role there is business development um, and kind of higher level executive uh, decision making. Um, so that, you know, my wife and I, Whitney and I, we work kind of, well, we live together, work together, you know, we're always together, <laughs> you know, texting and like at the same time, like while we're like on three meetings. So it's, <laughs> yeah, we, we um, yeah, my role there is really helping out with, with that. And we have three studio locations now in San Francisco with almost 300 students and 15 uh, part-time employees, 17 part-time employees. Um, so yeah, we just hired a couple. So that I'm kind of, yeah, loving doing that part of it because it's my business is small. It's really me and a few assistants and some outsourced, uh, you know, like things like accounting and services like that, that I don't really enjoy and don't want to spend my time on. Um, who likes accounting? A bigger operation. Sorry, what was that? As if who likes accounting? <laughs> yeah. I bookkeeper was one of the first things I outsourced. Like I was like, I, I'm not good with numbers. I hate spreadsheets, QuickBooks. <laughs> Like I love, I love the, the profit loss. Like I love looking at the, the, all the data combined on one page. I love looking at that to make decisions. Yeah. Um, so that, that's like for both businesses, that's, I love doing that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to be the one crunching the numbers and I don't want to be the one, you know, going through it. So yeah, I could say outsourcing is like if, if for, for those getting out there is that yeah. way you can outsource is another like small fun fact we can throw into this discussion yeah and i i don't want to throw the accountants under the bus i'm just saying no, i just like accounting <laughs> i've done it um, you know one of my little side jobs i you know love the place that i worked but actually doing um uh when everything works out at the end um that's the best part of accounting i think yeah um, and doing other people's things is probably different than doing your own as well. So it's like, you know, you just kind of want to see the end result when it's your own business. Um, not a great use of your time, I guess, either. But um, yeah, outsourcing the busy work, I guess. Right? For sure. Yeah, totally. And I think as you grow, especially as a business, like, and it, it, this was sort of also, well, part of, you know, there's, you were asking before, like, what are some of the things you want to know before getting started? And, um, with photography or just any business, honestly, I feel like kind of knowing where you want to go with it is a really important thing because like some people like going to like having 85 locations and 2000 employees and all like that may not be for you, you know, and that's not necessarily a marker of success, you know, and just because you have all that stuff doesn't mean you're even making more money or have happier, you know, because no money, more problems, the bigger your infrastructure, the more expenses there are and, and all that yeah. stuff. So I think it's important. I think it's important to outsource, but it's also important to know, like, how big do you want to grow? You know, you could do just as much with a five or 10 person company as you could with like a hundred person with way less headaches um, and way less problems. Like my wife and I, we, we own a hundred percent of our businesses. We never, we borrow a little bit of money, like lines of credit, it's a few thousand dollars here and there, but you know, we own everything and every, every ounce, every dollar, we don't owe anybody anything. It's all us. So yeah. that was really important to us. Um, awesome. But some people aren't scared of loans. Some people aren't scared of debt and they borrow millions of dollars. You know, that wasn't for us. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think to your point about success, I think, you know, you, you define what your success is, right? And, you know, one of the things like we've both worked with Coach Crystal and like one of the things you do is you say, okay, like, where do you want to be? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. And then you kind of backtrack and like figure out all of the steps you need to take to get there. And, you know, that picture, that is your success, whether that you know means making more money or having 85 locations, whatever yeah. it is, right? Um, yeah for you to decide and you shouldn't do that, you know, comparing yourself to others thing that like, I have a friend who does this and um, you're just miserable because you're never, you're never there, right? You're never satisfied. Yeah. Have if you're, if you're constantly. It's hard not to do. You really have to, if you're, if you're one of those people that gravitates towards, um, you know, comparing anything, you know, whether you're comparing a situation to a situation or, you know, a personal thing to another person, um, 
it's hard. You have to kind of force yourself to be like, okay, I can't do this because they're not me. They're not, it's not my life. You know, it's very different. I, I have trouble with that um, too. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's hard to stay positive in such a crazy world sometimes. And I think that, you know, it just depends on, you know, who you surround yourself with and, um, you know, Neil, you said, you know, you, you work with your wife, I'm sure it's great. And, um, you know, you guys can kind of lift each other up in that way. And, yeah. um, you know, so anyway, just thinking about that, um, um, I was going to ask one of the questions that we had written down was who are your influences? So I'm thinking about this, like people who inspire you, people who can lift you up, people who um, kind of can keep you out of that, you know, oh, I'm doing bad. This is, you know, I'm comparing myself to this person, that sort of thing. So who, who are your influences for um, like photography or your business or anything like that? Yeah, um, it's a, that's also a good question in that when I started out, I was like, I must have watched like eight hours a day of Creative Live, which is like an online learning platform for um, mostly creative, mostly creative work. It would start out with like photography and videography and stuff. Um, and pretty much anyone who was on that was someone I would be influenced by. And um, there were a few people who I really ended up liking their work, like Zach Arias and Joe McNally. Um, and so they're some somewhat well-known commercial photographers um, and some kind of people who are, who are like them. Um, and I studied what they did and I learned from their courses and I um, practiced what they wanted to do. And I feel like I, my goal was to like learn just enough of the technical and their style so that I could kind of be influenced by it. But I stopped short of like recreating anything because one of the most important things in photography, and this is really hard these days when like everyone's got a camera, everyone's a photographer, digital cameras are getting really good. Um, but you can't change the person and the passion and the creativity and the like technical stuff. Like you can learn that, but you can't, like you have to really hone your like passion for it and your creativity and your just your ability to kind of think on the fly. So I, I knew getting started that I was like smart enough to know that's what was going to carry me in the professional photography world. Your expertise is like, it's just assumed, <laughs> right? It's like, I'm hiring you for this awesome picture or like you guys, like I'm hiring you for an awesome website. It's assumed I'm going to get an awesome website, but what's the experience going to be like working with this person and what like extra little bit of tidbit are they going to put on that cake that I'm going to really want to, you know, take a bite of it. So yeah, that, I think people who inspired me to learn stuff like that, those were, you know, those were the people I really paid attention to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that we've found in our business too, that there's, I guess in, in the most basic way I can say it, there has to be, you know, like you said, some sort of experience, some sort of connection that you find um, with anybody that you hire. And, and, you know, I mean, the, everyone can say they have the experience and maybe most of the people do, but do you have, you know, can you, can you walk the walk? Can you talk the talk like that sort of thing? And then, you know, going to someone who's just kind of, or a business who's sort of more transactional, even if they do have the experience, it's like, uh, like, why would you want to do that versus working with someone who actually cares, who actually wants to put their passion into it, who, who has done and seen so many things that they want to share with you, you know, and try to improve the experience, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I hear you on that. Um, I definitely would rather go, I mean, for me, anyone, a uh, photographer, um, someone that I can kind of relate to more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if we finished the top three list back then. We kind of went into discussion after that. Hey, we can go back. <laughs> yeah. so I, was, I was thinking about it because it's sort of as a good, like what we were talking about now. And like the other two things I was thinking of were like knowing your craft is really important. Mm -hmm. You know, just knowing like, in a day where almost everyone's a photographer and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and all that stuff. Not that all that's like at a professional level, but yeah. um, you know, everyone like digital imagery is so ubiquitous and cameras are everywhere. Um, and granted, there's a big difference between yeah. the camera on my, you know, let's date this thing, my iPhone 10, you know, for when people are watching this five or 10 years from now, whatever iPhone's out at that point. Um, yeah. The camera's amazing, and the portrait feature on it is super rad. I have some really cute pictures of my kid with it, um, and I'm blown away by, you know, and you always see professional photographers who'll do like a YouTube short on like, you know, this iPhone versus this 
$30,000 Hasselblad camera. Um, and like in terms of looking it on a small screen, yeah, those pictures are great. But if you want to like blow them up or do a campaign, they break down really fast. Um, yeah. So, you know, knowing your craft is, is really important. It takes mad skill to compete in today's world of getting paid for things that are just assumed to be free or like four cents on some stock photography website. Yeah. Uh, you know, digital imagery is ubiquitous and it's really like, it's hard to get paid for that. Um, so yeah, we kind of have a similar problem. Um, our arch nemesis is those websites like Wix and Squarespace yeah, and Weebly. Plug and play stuff. You know, why, why come and work with us when you can go and, you know, build your own free little website? Yeah. And the difference for both of us, I think, is the experience, right? Like, yeah. we know what we're doing, you know what you're doing, and in the end, you're going to have, like, an amazing product or, or service that's just going to blow those other self, self, um, self-serve things out of the water. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's that's a lot of that's popping up in the photography world too. Like, I got into using drones for photography last year, um, and you know, got my commercial license from the FA and all that stuff. And there's actually a, there's a process to doing it legally, commercially. Um, and a lot of people out there they they may not be doing that. Um, you know, they might be sort of illegally creating stuff and not really knowing the rules. And yeah. you know, for me, like a big, like the aerial section on my website is like, it talks a lot about our credentials and experience and it shows images that I've done, um, you know, and stuff like that. But yeah, and there's, there's tons of websites out there now. And like, for some reason it's, it's sexy like, and it's exciting, the aerial drone stuff. So like anyone that can spend a thousand dollars on a drone now is like a photographer, like an aerial photographer, which you know, some of them are, some of them are great right out of the box, but you know, what, what's kind of set us aside and me aside in particular, I felt like is that I have like, well, I'm 39 now. So 39, yeah, and for 35 of them, I've probably been using a camera. So I have like all this lifetime of experience and now I'm putting it in a camera in the air. Whereas some folks are just like, they may be a great drone operator, but they're not necessarily a photographer. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's really in the, the line for most people, uh, even clients, even clients at a high level, the line between like good enough and super professional sometimes is very small, but the perception is, is there, I think on the client side uh, with certain businesses enough that, you know, we're still getting work. So yeah, but it's hard. It's getting harder and harder. And I'm getting I guarantee I'm getting undercut left and right. Um, because I'm not willing to just bend and break for there's a website out there, you can get a $300 shoot for all this stuff where I'm like, I'd be putting another zero on that. And I'm just like, uh, how are they producing this work for that little money? And it's, it's, there's a whole thing, especially in, in the drone world about how undercutting and all that because it's such a brand new industry. Um, and I'm hoping that settles out and I'm seeing it a little bit with the commercial work and the family work that I'm doing. Um, cause there's a lot of people out there, you know, they're competing with a lot of people and that's, yeah. it's saturated. And I'm sure you guys see that with your business too. Definitely. I, I, I think, think, I think it, so. you know, but it's, it, it makes things harder for, for, for us. <laughs> yeah, it does. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about though, now that we've called out the photographers who use the drones that may not go through the FAA process, mm -hmm. they're going to be sadly, sorely mistaken, sor sadly mistaken, sorely, I don't know, but they're going to be in trouble because um, the FAA, I know that either they fine you or they can take away your rights to even having that. You can get in trouble. Yeah, um, you and your client. Stuff, yeah. I know. So... And I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, I forget, someone else told me that she was, um, she also does like video and photography and she was taking the class to get the license. And I, I was just so fascinated, like, oh, I see, you know, it makes sense that you would need to know a lot more about that because you can get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of briefly mentioned, you know, if you, maybe you're taking a photo of something that you shouldn't be or it's copyrighted or, or who knows, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's kind I of think an individual even, like if an individual saw that you were taking photographs of them or something, like in, you know, they were just in the area or something. I mean, someone could go as far as, as taking a lawsuit out on you. I mean, that, that's your business, you know, it's gone. Yeah. A lot um, of, yeah, there, it, it really is. And like, there's the rules with, with 
uh, things, you know, things that you're putting in the air, like quadcopters and stuff, they're very different than, uh, I mean, like, all, it's such, there's so much gray area now. The rules are very different. You're in federal airspace. You're not really, you know, yeah. the only thing they can really regulate on the ground is where you take off and land. But once you're one millimeter above a blade of grass or that building, you're in federal airspace. You're not, you're not really, the, the police, sheriff, they cannot control you. Um, you can only be controlled by federal rules. So there's a huge misconception about, about that stuff. And that's not to go into too much detail there, but there's like, that's one of those things like knowing your craft, knowing yeah. the industry. Like I went barreling into the aerial stuff and I was studying and I got my license and all that stuff. And I was like, and then I started really learning about what it's like on the ground. And I was like, man, there's a lot to do. And I sort of backed off a little bit and I, I'm like, I've taken a more slow, um, kind of calculated learning process and, you know, taking things um, you know, slow with it. Cause especially in a, in a populated area, like we are in, in San Francisco Bay area, the rules are really complicated. And you look at a, an FAA uh, sectional chart of airspace for this Bay, it's insane, the rules. And then, you know, can't fly over people and within distances of certain things and all that, there's a lot to learn. Um, so that goes back to kind of like knowing your craft and knowing the rules and knowing like what, what you're doing before you go putting something in the air or going on, you know, going onto property you're not supposed to be on, uh, whether it's, you know, ground operations or in the air. Sure. No. Yeah. And that's for any business. Know your know your rules, know I your wish, regulations, hire a lawyer. <laughs> I wish we I wish we had an FAA for when things like that happen with websites. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I think we'd be totally in the clear and a lot of people wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, and rightfully so, but um yeah, just throwing that out there too. Um okay, did you name did you name all the three things that you wanted to name? I mean, I know it was hard to, to kind so. of dwindle uh, it down to three, but. Well, yeah, we talked about not all fun and photos, knowing your craft. I guess the other one would be kind of knowing what you want to focus on, um, you know, because at first you'll be doing a, whatever comes your way to make a buck, um, you know, and then eventually you'll need some specialties that you'll be known for. So, and there's a caveat to that and, Excuse me, in my case, which is that I sort of have two arms of my business where I have the commercial side and then I have the family and portrait side, which is kind of the more like retail almost side of photography where it's like direct to clients. I'm selling digital files and prints and artwork um, to everyday people. And then there's the commercial side, which is totally different in terms of conversations, contracts, how the business goes, what the photos are going to be used for, their marketing businesses, their storytelling, their personal social media campaigns. Um, and it's my business to business. So it's very businessy. Um, and that's how I stay busy is that I have both arms of the business and depending on the year or whatever, I might be doing more shoots in one or the other. Um, and I, I kind of have some industries I sort of focus in on the uh, commercial side. And then I have a style, which is like a storytelling lifestyle thing that I've built my family photography business on. But in, in photography and any business, I think it's important to specialize, you know, unless you're like Amazon, you sell everything or Walmart or whatever. But like as a service, you really, you want to get known for, for something. You, you want to be like the go-to guy who, you know, puts drones in the air and like, crazy places and or you want to be like the guy who's uh i don't know doing industrial photography for um hard to get hard to reach places or something like that so there there has to be a little bit of that um otherwise you're not really seen as an expert yeah so if you so if you were just starting out and say you know you weren't well like i don't know if you weren't exactly sure but you had an idea of what you were you know going to do is there sort of like a go-to camera that would be like a great, um, or I mean, just like a grouping of equipment that you should always have to start out with when you're going to pursue something? Because like, I mean, you know, there's differences obviously in taking pictures with drones versus, you know, taking family portraits mm -hmm. versus, but, you know, considering someone who's going into that, you know, maybe there's an investment part of it that you need to be ready to make. Um, like, what would you say to that? Yeah, 
that's always a great question. And like, especially photographers tend to be like gearheads and like love gear and stuff like that. And I loved gear at first and I like got all this stuff and like, I have like a closet full of stuff. I don't even use half of it now because eventually I figured out like, which tools do I really like? You know, it's probably like painters or like, you know, artists, you have like your, your giant set of pens, your pencils, and you probably only use like three because you really like, you tend to like have a style and you learn them, right? So for me, I've always been a Nikon guy. Like I know people like to talk about their, um, their brand of, of gear and it's really like Nikon, Canon, Sony are like some of the three top ones right now. Um, or if you have like $8,000 to spend on a camera, you can get like a Hasselblad or a Leica or something. But, um, us regular guys, um, I use Nikons. I, I, it was the first camera that was put in my hand. It was a, a fully manual 35 millimeter film Nikon FM10, and it was not the, the first real camera. You know, after like point and shoots when I was a kid. But I just really love the way like Nikon cameras work. So I married the brand. That's kind of how you are as a photographer. You tend to like. I think it's you know what computers. It's like you just marry like whatever brand, um, and you you get into it, and then you start building a kit. So I have, uh, I use a Nikon D810, which is a pretty high megapixel camera. That D850 is my dream. It just came out. It's like the next generation. But you don't necessarily need, like that's their professional line of camera, but you can get in it for, you know, much less investment than that on a camera, um, like a semi-professional camera. Um, and then yeah, focusing that. on glass lenses is really important because those outlast your cameras. So I always recommend like, if you have, you know, you have whatever you can spend on a camera, don't, you know, don't go nuts. But if you can get to like the professional realm, that's great. The semi-pro stuff is great too. And definitely lenses, like don't cheap out on lenses, especially because those will last way. Like I'll have a lenses for decades. Cameras I'm replacing like every three years, maybe four tops. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point about the cameras. Like, part of why like you started with Nikon and you stay with Nikon is because you get the lenses and then they can, they fit on all of the Nikons as you keep yeah. growing. Right. Yeah. Um, I ended, I ended up being a Canon girl. So I started mm -hmm. with the Canon digital rebel and um, kind of moved up from there. Yep. Um, I was trying to find something really quick. I don't know where it is, but I was going to pull out some old digital camera that I had. Oh, nice. Yeah. Like Kodak digital camera. <laughs> The like first? the first generation of the ones that have a little screen. Yeah. Uh, that's about as technical as I got. And, the first um, digital camera I ever used, uh, it was like, it was this Sony. It was gigantic. It was like the size of a brick. And it took those like 1.4, was that 1.4 megabyte or the discs? Yeah. The, the hard shell yeah. 3 disc. <laughs> and they probably shot like a 320 by like a 180 pixel digital image you could fit like 10 or 15 of them on it. <laughs> so it was almost like using like that was the film and i remember it was in college that was <laughs> that was the first digital camera i ever used they had to check it out from like the you know, like tech department and i remember i was in a landscape natural history class and i was like taking like nature pictures with this disc camera i should go to my computer and pull them up it'd probably be hilarious <laughs> yeah digital photography's come a long way there's like you know consumer level 40 50 megapixel stuff and there's you know 120 megapixel medium format cameras that are 20 30 thousand dollars just for the camera you know never mind the back and then the lens and all that stuff um yeah you could have a 300 dollars setup you could have a 30 you know, 300 thousand dollars setup you know um so camera wise, I think, you know, whatever, whatever you can do. I mean, there's people out there making amazing artwork with iPhones and yeah. Samsung S8s or whatever, you know, and Google pixels and stuff. So I think professionally and not focusing on gear, I always go back to like focusing on the artwork and the passion and all that. And, you know, try out gear, go to swaps and meets and clubs and friends and just use stuff until you find yeah. what you like, like don't go ahead and buy, rent it. You yeah. can rent a camera for like a hundred bucks, which is, you know, a good amount of money, but at least it's better than buying it for $4,000, you know, and then not liking it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, that's a good point. Yeah. I also use some flash and strobe work um, in some of my photography. So I use the Nikon speed lights, the smaller ones um, off camera. And then uh, I really like pro photo lighting. It's like really expensive high end lighting, um, but I bring it on shoots. Uh, I rent it for shoots when, um, when I want to. So anything I, I don't, I don't own, I can rent basically. 
So mm -hmm. I don't use it that much. I, I don't, you know, if I don't use it, if I had like a 14 millimeter wide angle architecture lens, I don't do a ton of architectural work, but sometimes for an interior designer or as part of a storytelling project for a business, they might want some interior shots. So it's like a $25 lens, but I'll rent it for 30 bucks, you know, a few times a year. Um, so I don't have to carry it in my bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So I think we have one last question for you before we start wrapping up. Um, what was the most memorable session you've ever done? That's a cool question. Um, I've had a few that are super memorable. Um, just fun stuff happens on shoots and you know, you get, you get really close with people too when they're like letting you like being you know, in front of a camera is really intimidating even for me. So you kind of get to bond with people. Um, but I've, I've really enjoyed um, some of the ones where I get out there into more abstract places and um, there's some that can like some of my favorite shoots are on my website um, and this top shot section it's kind of like uh, like I have portfolios that are like one or two shots from my favorite sessions but the top shots takes it to the next level where it's more of an inspirational portfolio and shows like what we did for a whole project for a business um, but I, I signed an NDA on this one so I can't really say the client name but it's a well-known Bay Area shipping port um, and we spent a few days climbing cranes and getting access to places that you would normally need high level security clearances for. Um, and that was really memorable, like watching sunsets from like, you know, like, I don't know how many people get to go up to the top of the shipping crane yeah. in a port and stuff like that. Like, yeah, that'd be awesome. it was rad. Um, and just telling stories of like, and shipping ports aren't necessarily like they're cool and they're ma like majestic in their own way, but they're not necessarily known for being like beautiful places like yeah. forests and mountains, you know, in Malaysia. So I was like, let me just um, make it beautiful. And that was really fun. So it was like a three day project, like with pre production ahead of time and a ton of post production for how things were shot. Um, and I'm hoping to get back back there with them at some point with for a drone project. But yeah, that was um, that was one of my most memorable projects because it was like it was um, it's rare that I'm like on a photo shoot and I'm like almost terrified of like dying. <laughs> there were like a couple times where it's like this is pretty cool and I'm like trying to GoPro myself because I'm like this is so cool you know and like making videos There's actually a video on my Facebook page of me like and I, if you look at and you know me well enough you could tell I'm a little like oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that was how I felt I I whenever I was in San Francisco I stayed in a fourth floor condo and there was sort of like a um you know a fire escape and the bottom, the floor was just kind of, you know, metal grates sort of thing. And I've never seen anything like that before. So I was outside. I'm just like, oh, okay. I tried taking a picture. I'm like, no, wait, what if I drop my phone? And yeah. you know, all these things run through your head. But um, nevertheless, it was a really cool sight to see. So. Yeah, totally. I know. I was worried about dropping my stuff and like. Yeah. You know, and we had to crawl through these like little tube things. We were like passing packs and it was, it was fun. Um, that cool. sounds crazy. I'm not sure I could do that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little less intense. I like crave it now. I've done some really cool. I like the industrial. Like I've gotten really into like really enjoying industrial photography. And I did a shoot for a recycling manufacturer. They take glass. They take waste glass from recycling, like you know our recycling here in the Bay Area, and they process it into other products. So sort of a dirty, dirty uh, facility just by you know definition, but making it it looked beautiful and capturing the beauty of it, like the glass shattered and the machinery in, in certain ways uh, and the people that work there uh, that I love doing. I like, that's one of my favorite things lately is going into places that are thought of as like ugly or derelict or in this industrial park that no one really sees except the people that work there and making it look beautiful or showing off the reality of what it is for how we live. Um, so I, I like doing stuff like that. I really like storytelling. And the more I can marry my past career life of like the environmental work and the sustainability work in, the, um, in that industry with my current work, the, the better. Because then I feel like I haven't really turned my back on that. I'm still kind of working in that world too. Yeah, I think, I think Pittsburgh would be a really great place for you to travel to to do a shoot. Um, yeah. with everything you just said, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in Pittsburgh currently. That's where okay. I, I live. Um, I've, I grew up here and there's so much stuff like that in the city. 
Uh, and there's so much stuff that they're doing now too that has that same idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, making something into something else to kind of keep the history to it and, you know, create new things and new experiences and, and keep it, you know, sustainable for the city. Um, right. That kind of stuff's really cool to see, especially I would, I would say in, in the photography that you do, you know, the storytelling part of it is, is probably really one of the most important parts to, you know, the work that you put out there. Yeah, I, I think so. I think if you don't, if you're not telling a cohesive story, it's confusing and it doesn't make sense. You know, that's fine yeah. for like Instagram, like instant moments are cool to have like one image that tells, you know, a moment. But the, one of the biggest challenges with the work that I do is like telling a cohesive story and going in and like making it a, a full, a full circle story and not just a bunch of random things. But um, that's, you know, people love to learn about the businesses that they patronize this day and age with, in social media and with small business, you know, big small business comebacks and stuff like that. Like people love to know where the things they use every day come from. Mm -hmm. They love to. And I love to tell that story. That's, that's one of my favorite things. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Neil. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience and your knowledge about photography yeah, thank you for having me. It's It's been a fun discussion with you, too. Yeah. Can you tell us again what your two businesses are so our listeners can can find you? Yeah. It, um, the photography business is Neil David Photography. It's online at neildavid.com, and it's spelled N-I-A-L-L-D-A-V-I-D. Um, and, again, I focus on commercial work with businesses, uh, mostly telling stories for their marketing. And then I do lifestyle family photography. And the other business is Songbird Studios, and it's online at songbirdsf.com. And it's a primarily a one-on-one -on -one vocal coaching uh, business. And we have about 300 students right now, three locations in San Francisco. The new location is definitely looking for, for way more people to fill, fill those seats there. Um, we also do uh, workshops for singing, songwriting, uh, performance, and lots of other things there too. Cool. Um, um. I like to sing a little bit. I might be looking you guys up. Yeah, come on in. We do a, a free intro lesson for, for anyone who wants to come try it out, come sing with one of our instructors. We have probably the best team of vocal coaches uh, in the whole Bay Area for sure. Awesome. Okay. And then next time, what are we talking about, Danielle? Oh, we are going to be talking with the – lovely guys of Verducci Event Productions. Um, they are an event production company in San Francisco, and I think they're widely known for, um, you know, DJ services for wedding, corporate, um, you know, social events like birthdays, bat mitzvahs, that kind of stuff. Um, and they're just like super awesome business owners all around, and I think we're just going to kind of dig in a little bit. Um, I don't know where the conversation's going to go at the moment, but you will know what it is next episode. Let's just put that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for joining this Mac Happy video cast where we explore all things web and marketing. Until next time. Bye. bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you for listening to the Smack Happy Design videocast. For more information and downloads, visit smackhappy.com forward slash videocast, where you'll find more episodes and the opportunity to subscribe on YouTube or iTunes. You can also sign up for our newsletter delivered to your inbox monthly. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues. Again, that's smackhappy.com forward slash videocast. See you next time.